Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We ask your blessing as we read your word, the Bible. May your Holy Spirit teach us, may you guide us, point us, lead us in the direction of all truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, uh, we'll be in Revelation uh, 2 again today. I'm going to, uh, we are going to go through the church of uh, Thyatira today, but uh, I'm, I'm going to start a little bit. Uh, let's look at Revelation well, in Revelation 1, I didn't, for some reason, put the verse there. It's, it's near the end, 17, 18, 19, somewhere. Uh, he says, uh, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, oh, it's, it's early in Revelation 1, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, uh, Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now, I, I found it interesting just rereading that again. He wrote it to all of them. You know, we tend to think, well, he wrote just this to this one, this to this one. He did write it to all of them. There are specific pieces uh, going to each of them, you know. But I think in that, you know, I think this should be, morning, uh, this should be studied by all churches, you know, and there's there's a failure to do that. Let's remember Revelation 1.19. It says, write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, the things which shall be hereafter. You know, it's really pointing the things that, the things that was, is, and is to come in that. Uh, we talked about that before. And I, I believe, just in looking at that, I was like, I believe this is true for all eternity. You know, you can look at this. God is eternal. You know, if we look at from the point right now, these churches did exist in history. They actually existed. So uh, they were there. They are things that uh, he, he has seen. These churches represent time periods, or they're the things that, uh, in from our perspective, sorry, I'm looking from our perspective, they existed in history. So that's the things that was. That's in the past, right? Because they actually were churches. As we look through, I'm going to look a little bit at the time periods in church history just for today because I haven't done that uh, yet. Um, so as we look at them in time periods, it's really, we've seen a lot of the things that that were already were. We can look back and we can see all these as time periods. You know, we still see these churches today in terms of the types of churches. I think they're in existence. They're all, all seven still in existence, so they are the things that are, because we're in the church age, and when we get to Revelation 4, and it says that, uh, you know, here's the things that are going to be hereafter, metatauta in the Greek is what it talks about, that the things that are going to, the things which are going to be, you know, we'll see that. Right now, I think we're in the Laodicean age, as you look through all seven, we're in the last stage of the churches, Okay. I mean, our hope is not to be in the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church, I think, is rampant. But the tribulation will start in chapter 4. Those will be the things that are hereafter as we look at that verse in 19. And eventually, this all is going to happen. And then when you look at it and you look back in eternity, when we're in eternity, okay, there will be the things hereafter. So if, if let's just kind of time travel for a minute and say we're in eternity, <laughs> And think about it. Yeah. You know, could, how would we read that? Well, the, the church age and all those things, they're going to be the things that, that was, the things that were, right? They'll be in the past. Right. But then the, you'll have the new heavens and the new earth, and they'll, they'll be the things that are, but they'll also be the things that are to come because it's eternal. <laughs> you know, so you can look at that, and I just thought it was interesting. But I wanted to quick look, look at the timeline as ages and I'll go through this kind of fast, and then we'll get to the church of uh, Thyatira. The timeline is ages. Ephesus was 30 A.D. to approximately 100 A.D. We already talked about the church of Ephesus. It was uh, the greatest time in the church. Now, I may have a source that differs on some of these years. Understand, I, I think we can all look at those, and that isn't going to be the big deal. So if you have a different source and you say, oh, he said it was this year, well, this one I think is pretty clear. You know, 30 AD, the time of Jesus, when his ministry began, you know, in that sense, well, it should be really after his death. I don't know why I have the 30 AD, but whatever. Up to the end of the apostolic time, roughly 100 AD at the death of John. It was the greatest time of the church. It was the apostolic church. 
Now, I firmly believe there are no more apostles, no more prophecy in tongues. It's not needed. We've talked about it before. I'm not going to belabor the issue uh, except for something maybe a little bit new. 1 Corinthians 13, you can look at that. Tongues will cease all that. That which is in part has come. We have the whole revelation of God's Bible. So as soon as John wrote the book of Revelation, that's there. But I want to look at Revelation 2, verse 2. Again, just in this, it says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how, thou, and how thou canst not bear them that are evil, and how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and found them liars. So as I looked at that just kind of fresh this week, as we look at these as the ages, why is this the only church that does that? First of all, they're the only one trying the apostles. I think there's two reasons. You know, I'll say in terms of the timeline, okay, there were people coming out saying they're apostles at that time, and they would try them as apostles, and they'd find out they weren't. And there were the true apostles in this time period. But then, I think the other reason it's not given to the other churches, in part, is because there are no more apostles. So that's why you don't see that, that it's not even, God would say it's not even necessary for me to do that, because the apostolic age is over. Okay? So to me, that you know became even clearer as I looked at that in Revelation 2 too. Now, the second church, Smyrna, the persecuted church, we have the little map up here. There's a huge portion of the world that is really restricted to the gospel. You know, there's portions, uh, Brother Momo in India, we pray for him. You know, it's it's hostile to the gospel. You know, it's uh, tough places to be. Uh, but Smyrna, again, came from the word myrrh. Okay, it was about roughly uh, 100 AD now till the rapture, honestly. <laughs> okay, now we can say 100 AD to 312 where the new next church comes in. But in all honesty, the church has been persecuted from 100 AD in that time uh, all the way till now and until the rapture of this church happens. That church of Smyrna will go up. If they're, you know, being persecuted for Lord, they'll go up in that. But myrrh was used in embalming, which means bitter and intense age of Roman persecution. Again, we talked about the ten Roman emperors that bitterly persecuted the church. we it talked about the ten days of trial. Uh, it says, fear none of these things thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that shall be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. I think that points to ten different emperors. We talked about that in... Uh, the lesson on Smyrna. Um, I have no doubt some were tortured a literal 10 days too. You know, but I think in general that those refer to those time periods of those emperors. So um, then we get to uh, Pergamos. Uh, 312 AD uh, to, honestly, Pergamos is 312 AD through the tribulation. Because if you're in the church of Pergamos, you're going to go through the tribulation. You have to get out. You have to repent. You have to get yourself in the church of Philadelphia to go in the rapture, right? Okay. So, I mean, but 312 to 607, we can say, but that's where it became a cultural hub. Uh, this is what we studied uh, last, last week. Represents a time in which the world was brought into the church. Okay. Really, the enemy, Satan, had a new strategy. If you can't beat them, join them. Okay, because he was persecuting the church and it was growing like crazy because that persecution grows the church many times. Okay, so he said, well, let's get the world to join the church. So during this time, many pagan practices, we looked at that, became mixed with Christianity. Revelation 2.15, it says, So hast thou also them that hold it to the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent or else I will come to thee quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Uh, so again, just a couple of notes. Uh, saint and angel worship was introduced in 375 AD, causing people to worship idols. Okay? Uh, purgatory was introduced in 593 AD. There's no such doctrine in the Bible. Amen. Okay? Amen. And, uh, but so the, why were those introduced? So people would continue in sin, especially yeah. sexual sin. Yeah. And think they could get to heaven later because they would go to purgatory and then get tried. No, it's a point that a man wants to die and then the judgment, he wants repentance. But it ignores faith, it ignores repentance in that church. So there was a marriage in Pergamos to a cultural 
a, a culture and government, uh, so the, the culture and government married the church and tried to intermix. And that's been going on throughout all time. As you get too much into politics, I think uh, that's what happens. You know, and I've been guilty of that myself at times. You know, the church needs to be about proclaiming Jesus Christ, proclaiming his coming, proclaiming that he died, that he suffered on the cross. That's what we're supposed to do. But in, as we get into culture and government, and I'm not saying Christians shouldn't be involved in government. It, it's righteous rulers are much better for the world. <laughs> okay. But um, <clears throat> we're to guard against the illusion of true doctrine where we're. You know, we let things in. Now, Thyatira, and again, I'm, I'm first I'm going to look, we'll get to Thyatira, but I'm looking at the ages. Thyatira started in about 607 A.D. to through the tribulation. Because the church of Thyatira, if you're in that one, you will go through the tribulation. Okay, but again, to roughly 1520 A.D., if, you know, that's where the next church age Looks. You know, if you're looking at it in ages, you can say, well, this age ended and now we're in this age. I mean, we're in the Laodicean age. But the church of Thyatira has, you know, has gone even, you can say, the whole time. There's always been that type of church of Thyatira. Okay. But however, uh, let's see. Uh, it's the rise. To, so today we'll study. It's really the rise of Romanism, you know, in that time. It re, uh, It's really represent representative of Roman Catholicism and its rise to power, also known as the Dark Ages, okay? Uh, they started in 11 AD, in the middle of that period, as we look at it, a period, the sale of indulgences in 1190 AD, which would be raising money to purchase a piece of paper that said all sins past and present were forgiven. So then many started to live in a total abandon to sin. Well, my past and present, because I have this piece of paper saying I'm fine. No, you need blood shed for sin. You need the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? Sardis, the church of Sardis, started in roughly in terms of a time period. Again, it was always there, and there, you've always seen this type of church, but in terms of time period, 1520, going through the tribulation. It's really the dead church. It starts, it marks the start, really, of the Protestant Reformation. Okay? And it's interesting, you know, because a lot of things happened in the Reformation that were good, but boy, they couldn't get away from that mother church. Okay? And that's still back in, and we'll talk about that one next week. You know, I know you are, you are alive but dead. It's really a picture there uh, they look alive because they have a name in Christ that resembles that, but they're really dead because they're not teaching born again. We could get into infant baptism and how that fools people into thinking that they're saved, but they're not. They're, they're dead because they've never been born again. They've never come to a place where they themselves personally trusted Jesus Christ. That's why you, you talk to a lot of people in a lot of churches, well, I've always been a Christian. You cannot have always been a Christian. You need to be born again. You have to come to a realization that you are a bankrupt sinner and you need a savior. You know, so that's part of that. Not to get too ahead into next week, but if you're reading ahead, I, um, there you go. You can look at that a little bit. But Revelation 3, 2 says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Uh, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. They did a lot of good things, but they didn't get it all straightened out. <laughs> okay. And um, we know the King James Bible was compiled in 1611 in the middle of that. That was a fantastic thing. They got that part right. But they didn't adhere all the way to the Word of God. You know, they allowed a lot of things to creep in. Now, Philadelphia, about 1750 to the rapture. Okay? Because Philadelphia is going out. He's taking the church out. They won't go through the tribulation. So as you look at five of these churches, they're going to go that type of church, if you're in that type of church, it, when it started, you're going to go through the tribulation because you don't want to be in that church. You will suffer going through that tribulation. If the rapture happened today and you fall into that category and you're like thinking, oh, my good work saved me or whatever it might be, you're trusting the wrong thing. But if you're trusting Christ, he's going to take you out and he will keep you out of that uh, hour of trial that comes on the whole world. Um, so, uh, 1750, why approximately that? As we look at it, a time frame, it was a great time of revivals with the Word of God. The Word of God was being preached. You saw 
Uh, many men of God who started things, uh, the Wesleys, they started things. I don't think they would be allowed in their churches today. <laughs> okay? They would kick them out because they've so gone away from the Word of God. You know, um, Revelation 3.10 Talks just a little bit on Philadelphia, if you look ahead. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon the whole world, and try them that dwell upon the earth. They kept the word, they guarded the word. That word in Greek means really to guard, to hold fast, is what they're told to do. Okay, the last age, then the Laodicean age. We're in it now, I believe, in terms of an age. It started in about 1900 AD, and it will go through the tribulation. Because this is the apostate church. It is the church that has ignored the word of God. It's allowed everything in. Worldliness, everything. Sin, all throughout. And that church, they're denying the word. They're not holding fast to the word like the church of Philadelphia. Revelation 3.17, it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They're not clothed in white they're not clothed they're not covered by the blood of the lamb they are apostate they turn from the truth so today revelation 2 we're going to look at the church of smyrna but i just thought it would be interesting since we hadn't done that just to look at those quickly as timelines i thought that would be of interest but revelation 2 18 to 29 studying the church of smyrna today 18 and unto the angel of the church in thyatira write these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. We'll read more as we go. We're going to try to get through verse 29 today. We should be able to do that. But Thyatira was known for purple dye. I threw on my purple shirt today just, you know, since we're going through it. Uh, one method of this, there were different methods. They would, they would extract a dye from certain plants. One method was to take a certain marine mollusk. They would crush the shell of this uh, animal, this thing found in the ocean, to find this small, tiny little gland that released a fluid that was red and purple on, on exposure to air. Okay? And... Uh, I guess if you look at Sidon and Tyre, go to Matthew 11 quick. I, I do want to look at this because I just found an interesting uh, parallel, I guess, there. You know, as uh, Thyatira was about this purple, I found it interesting that at Sidon and Tyre, they still have piles of these shells. They also produced this purple. Um, and Tyre, I, sometimes I like to look at the meanings of these cities. I think the Lord has so much more in the Bible, and you could study, honestly, you could have a couple chapters, and some of these churches, the persecuted churches, they might only have one book of the Bible, but and they have it memorized, and they study, and I believe the Lord keeps speaking things to them through it all, you know, but, you know, I was thinking this week, because I was even looking at a map, I didn't come up with any, but it was interesting, as you look at the map, when it starts, and it goes with Ephesus, and then it goes to Pergamos. And as you go around this map, as you go to the seven churches, it kind of goes in this. It's kind of in a circle, which to me just, I mean, my thought was it's kind of interesting because it is kind of shaped like a clock, those seven cities. And it kind of shows a time, you know, in that. And I was just wondering if the Lord's not showing something more, but I, I didn't have an answer to that, you know. But it was interesting. But I do think in these, when it, whenever there's names, the names mean a lot in the Bible. But Tyre means rock, and Sidon means fishery. You know, they would take it would take about ten thousand of these shells and finding these little glands to make a usable amount of dye. So you can imagine it was a lot of work to get this purple color. Thus, it was very expensive. So if you wore purple, it indicated you know that you were pretty wealthy. You know, and if you were a dealer in purple, as Lydia was, you probably were fairly wealthy. And we'll talk about her as we go uh, today, too, from the book of Acts. But in Matthew 11, where I had to turn, look at verse 21. It's interesting, because the Lord talks about Tyre and Sidon, and he also talks about Chorazin and Bethsaida. Woe unto thee, verse 21, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you have been done in Tyre and Sidon, then... 
or they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more toler tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Now it's interesting because, okay, I said, you know, Tyre means rock, Sidon <laughs> means fishery. I don't think those are actually good things, by the way. I'm, I'm just uh, flipped to Jeremiah 16 while I talk a little bit here. Chorazin means mystery. I found that really interesting. And um, then uh, Bethsaida means house of the hunt. So it's interesting to me, as many times through the church ages, the people of God, by this mystery Babylon religion, have been hunted down. And I just found that interesting, that it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, you know, being uh, this rock, which I think represents a fake rock, and... and fishery, which also can mean that they're hunting too, in this sense. But Jeremiah 16, verses 15 to 17 says, and, and again, I'm not trying to find something that isn't there. I think that bears a lot more study. But uh, Jeremiah 16, verse 15 says, But the Lord liveth that brought up, the, brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, and from all the lands whither he had driven them, and I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. He's going to bring them again. Verse 16. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. This is not a good thing. They're going to hunt them down. And, you know, when you look at those towns, two of them, one house of the hunt, one fishery, they will fish them, and I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain. And from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks, all those things in there. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from my eyes. And it's interesting how the house of the hunt, that city, and Chorazin, the mystery, that things are going to be very bad for them, especially those that have persecuted the nation of Israel. So anyway, you can probably find something more in there. I just wanted to mention that. I thought it was interesting as we study this purple that those cities also were known. Uh, Tyre and Sidon was known for the purple as well. But we have two cities chastised even more by the Lord. But Thyatira could be just as well called the adulterous church. That could be another name. As I said earlier, this age uh, could be said to have started in 607 AD and will go through the tribulation as the false this false adulterous church will go into that tribulation no doubt some will come to christ uh before that time repent and go in the rapture because they'll become part of the true church having trusted christ but some will possibly come to christ during that time of the tribulation because they're not hearing the truth now some have heard the truth and they've rejected it and they'll be sent a great delusion and believe a lie during the tribulation okay i mean that's the scary part you know, in 2 Thessalonians, where it talks about God will send great delusion that they'll believe, believe a lie to those that heard the truth and rejected it after the rapture. And that's a real scary thing. So if you've heard the truth and you haven't put your trust in Jesus Christ out there, you need to do that. <laughs> You're not promised tomorrow. Okay? So, um, the church, this church, it tolerates immorality in the midst of it. Again, that sale of indulgences where they sold this piece of paper. So, oh, your past, present, future sins are... That's what it is to come to Christ, to trust Him. You don't have any piece of paper that can do that. And they did that. I think there are still people today who give things to a church for their dead family members. That, that decision's already been made. There's nothing you can do. You can give away all your wealth. It isn't going to buy them out of anything. Okay? Luke 16, verse 19, as we look at this being the color of purple, Luke 16, 19, you, you don't have to turn there. You've heard this one many times. There was a certain rich man who was, was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. We know the uh, for this certain rich man, he being in torments, lifted up his eyes in hell and cried out to Father Abraham to dip a cloth with water and touch his tongue. And that would have you know helped him a little bit, but there's a great gulf fixed. He couldn't. You know, Abraham was in the in Abraham's bosom or paradise. Um, but his faith, that man, he's clothed in purple. So let's understand, being clothed in purple does nothing for you. You can buy this piece of paper. You can try to buy this expensive clothes that were made from the shells of these mollusks. But he's clo you're clothed on the outside. This man was clothed on the outside. The inside wasn't clean. And Jesus always pointed to that with the Pharisees. 
You know, so if in your church you have all these fancy things and, and people look regal and royal and they look religious, it may mean absolutely nothing. And in truth, it means nothing. I'm not saying we shouldn't be reverent to God, but if you're holding a certain person, a uh, pastor is called to be a minister. Yes, you in the congregation, you should have respect to the pastor, but the pastor is also called to be a servant. And he should be serving in that sense. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to, oh, you're going to treat him poorly, put him down or anything like that. And the pastor shouldn't be treating people poor, but he should be willing to serve, willing to help, willing to do things. Um, it's not about a place of reverence and holding him higher. Um, but that man's fate was hell. He, again, uh, you can repent if you're in that system, come out of the system. I remember this one actor uh who uh, was talking, he, he was, he gave up sex for Lent. I remember him talking about that on TV. Okay, that act can do nothing for you. That should be part of repentance. You should be like, okay, I'm, uh, if you're, if you're married, then that, that's the marriage bed. That's what that is for. But outside of that, anything is sin and it doesn't do any good. Some live under this form of paganism now today. Again, you can't buy it. It's a gift you receive by faith. Um, if you go to Romans 4, it's, it, it's always been by grace through faith. That's the plan of the past. It's the plan in the present, the plan in the future. The Bible also has warnings about riches corrupting the soul. Psalm 62.10, if you want to turn there, I'll let you. Uh, I always think it's good just to see it with, with your eyes, and it's nice. And then we're going to flip to Proverbs 11. So Psalm 62 and Proverbs 11. You know, again, we can be rich. We can, you know, the Laodicean church has more of that, but it doesn't mean throughout all these churches. That's not part of the problem. Psalm 62.10 says, Trust not in oppression, or become not vain in robbery. If riches increase... Set not your heart upon them. Mm -hmm. Set not your heart upon riches. There it is. I mean, we're talking about the wealth of this world. Uh, well, Proverbs eleven twenty eight. If you're trusting riches to get you out of hell, it's not going to happen. Proverbs eleven twenty eight. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. Okay. How do you become righteous? You become righteous by trusting what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and that's it. Yep. Amen. Yeah. So again, in this to this church, as we just started out the first couple verses, there's always some, there's always kept five things I've been going through all, all the churches. First is an aspect of the risen Christ. So the aspect here, it says, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes unto like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Let's remember in 1 John, uh, let's go to 1 John 5. I wasn't sure I was going to read this, but I want to read this. I think it's good. Um, 1 John 5, 5, who is he that overcometh? It's he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. But let's go to 1 John 5. Let's read a little bit more uh, today. Let's read verses 1 through 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. That's the problem in the church of Thyatira. Okay? They're not holding to that doctrine and they're not, they're just, they're licensing sin and they're going to allow it by certain teachers creeping in. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and that his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. It's, again, by grace you are saved through faith in Christ. Who is he that overcometh the world? He is, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So I believe every time those that come out and are the overcomers in these churches, all the overcomers are promised those things. You know, he specifically talks to the churches, but all the overcomers, everyone who's trusted Christ will eat of the tree of life one day as you go through these different things. But to be an overcomer, you have to have trusted Christ. And he's encouraging them, put your faith in Christ, don't put your faith in other stuff. Okay? 
He can see our hearts. Let's go to Matthew 9. Now, how do I know he can see our hearts? Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of both soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I always have to have a little science to help myself remember that one. But <laughs> Matthew 9, verse 2. Why did I start in verse 2? You can read verse 1 if you want. But, and behold, they brought him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. Now notice, they said within themselves. They didn't verbalize this. They're saying it in their heart. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts. There he's God. He knows the thoughts. He is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He sees every thought you have ever thought. Right now, he is so powerful, he knows every thought of the person in this room. He knows every thought of the person out there watching basketball. He knows every thought of every person on the world. He's, God is the only one that can do that. He is omniscient, which is one of those words that we've studied kids over and over. He's omniscient, all-knowing. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's the only one like that. There is none like thee, O God. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go to thy own house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Now, um, Apparently in Thyatira, they worshipped Apollo, the sun god. I think there's an interesting contrast with uh, Jesus and his eyes being the flame of fire in this. Uh, the, but the sun god was their chief deity. So some would say, and I think it's a good representation, that the flame of fire here is to point out the true god. They're looking at a false god as the sun god. You need the true god whose eyes can see into the heart. That's what we just saw in that passage. He can see your thoughts. Okay, um, so I, I think his eyes in that as the flame of fire point to him as the truth. Brass feet. Really, let's remember, brass from Exodus means judgment. He's the judge, and it's fine brass. His judgment is perfect, but his sacrifice was also perfect. And he is perfectly just in letting you go if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Revelation 2, verse 23, again, Brass being that judgment, he is the judge. To all out there are all here, is he your savior or is he your judge? That's what you have to ask. Because he'll judge every single thought, word, and deed. Revelation 2.23, uh, jumping just ahead to the end of this part, just looking at his judgment, it says in that, And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. See, he sees in your heart. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. He sees every intent of what you've done in your heart. You know, now as the believer, you don't have to fear. But he sees the intents. As when we went through just briefly those rewards, he knows the reason you did something. Sometimes we might have a bad reason for doing it, even as a believer. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it's about so uh, showing men what we do. Now, the Bible says, so let your light shine before men. Okay, but I don't believe we do it to get the glory. Uh, it says, so let your light shine before men that our Heavenly Father receives the glory, that God gets the glory. So it shouldn't be so that I get the glory. Some people might put into the offering plate and make sure everybody sees it. Some might sneak it in, you know, however it is. Don't let your right hand and left hand know what your right hand is doing and vice versa. I might have had the order wrong, on that wrong, but you get the idea. Um, so uh, for those of you that are ambidextrous, it doesn't matter. Okay. So anyway, um, we don't want to do it with the intent. He sees the intent of our heart. He searches the reins of the heart. The reins of the heart. Your controlling motive, right? Mm -hmm. So those reins, it's like... Okay, why did I do that as a believer? 
Well, I did it so that I could show off to these people that I'm so good. Oh, man, you've lost your reward. Because he said, you already have it. And that's the reward you're going to get. We don't want to do it for that motivation. We want to do it because we love him, because he first loved us, and he sent his son to die for us. All right, so um, Revelation 1, verse 13 says, so look back a little bit just to, to reread this, because there's uh, he always points out some similarities to what was already identified. Remember, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It says, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, and as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, and they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Jesus is the God-man. His feet were pierced, taking on that, those, that punishment, that judgment for us if you're in him. Burned in a furnace taking our judgment, the fine brass, again, the perfect judgment of God. But the second aspect, it's always addressed to the pastors of these churches. It says, unto the angel of the church of Thyatira, uh, it says. The third aspect that I've always tried to point out, he states to each some common, uh, or let's see, um, some commendation, and then he also has some condemnation for all of them, except the condemnation goes, never goes to Smyrna, and never goes to Philadelphia, because Smyrna is under persecution, Philadelphia, so they have enough. <laughs> but Philadelphia is doing things the right way. So here in the commendation, verse 19, he talks about it. He says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. <laughs> A contrast to Ephesus here is Thyatira. The two churches are in some respects the exact opposite one of the other. In Ephesus, there's much zeal for all the uh, this, the disciples' teachings and the teachings of Christ, but little love. <laughs> they've lost sight of their love. Okay? Now, they've, they've really lost sight of their love. Notice they didn't lose their salvation, though, by the way. They need to, get, they need to repent and remember those first works. Uh, in Thyatira, there's much love, but a carelessness about doctrine, and they have let false doctrine in. And that's the difference, and we can see that today. And if we're honest, we've seen it in ourselves. <laughs> Where sometimes I'm here and sometimes I'm here. <laughs> you know, but when the focus is Christ, then all those things come together. And that's what we want. Uh, James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I believe that verse really sums it up, James 1.27. Because there's good works in there, but not works to save, works because you are saved, but then also uh, keeping oneself unspotted from the world. You're worrying about your sanctif sanctification so your light shines, but you're worrying about doctrine because you're holding to the word of God. So I think that verse is a good one to kind of say, uh, that helps me be in the Church of Philadelphia. <laughs> So, while Ephesus has really gone, in a sense, backwards, Thyatira has moved forward. I mean, they've done some good things because it says, I know thy works and the last to be more than the first. I mean, so they are moving forward in some things. So that the commendation, they're, they're given commendation for works. They're known for actions, not just belief. They're known for love. And it's the only church out of these commended for love of people, of the ones that there's negative things to. They're known for faith. They're motivated by faith in Christ. They're noted for service, ministry, and serving. They're noted for patience. They had patience, endurance, and steadfastness. They're doing more. The latter works exceed the first. So we see good things here, but the Lord has more condemnation for them than any other church. Okay? So the word of condemnation... And uh, this one, the fourth and fifth, I'm going to put together. The fifth thing is always concluding with a warning. Let's read verses 20 to 29, or 20 to 24 right now. So verse 20 of chapter 2. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, which means allow, thou allow that woman Jezebel, which call herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, 
and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But I say unto you, and the rest in Thyatira, as many as I have not, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, interesting there, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Well, the question always comes up, who is Jezebel? Uh, apparently this pastor in Thyatira at the time, if we're looking at it just to that church, ignored teachings possibly by a person or persons or in a sense a type of person who had the Jezebel spirit. I can't say it was a specific, specifically one person. It could have been one specific person at the time, but I think that person uh, you know, has existed through time. The Jezebel teachings or teachers were guilty of the same things really as the Nicolaitans uh, in, in some way, enticing people to commit or live in fornication, eat things sacrificed to idols. Uh, could it have been one person calling herself a prophetess? Possibly, yeah. Yes, um, I think there's a self-pride spirit, a contempt for holiness. You know, and you see that today with a lot of people, a contempt for anybody who wants to live holy. And they think, well, you're getting legalistic. You know, so they talk, you're, you're getting legalistic. No, we're called to live holy lives. We're called to be set apart. How is your light going to shine before man if you are going to be doing the same things, you know, if I was up here preaching and then I go out and I, I drink and I sleep around and I do all these things, is that really going to shine a light and people are going to think you have a changed life? Not at all. Okay? So, uh, you know, this spirit, I think, overlooks people living together in their church. Okay? Uh, and they're allowing them to attend. Do you ignore the practices of church discipline? Where you go to the person, you tell them what their sin is, and should they repent, you work through that. Should they not repent, you put them out of the church for such a time as Satan to try them. Okay? I think that's that spirit. And, you know, people say, well, that's not love. No, that's absolutely love, because I don't know if that person is saved or not. And I want them to come to a knowledge of salvation, not to sit there every Sunday in that seat just... Here, thinking, oh, I'm okay. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. that's not love. Yeah. Uh, you know, when a child goes to bed at night, he might think monsters are under the bed, right? And it might be in the closet. So you come in, you shine a light, you show them, see, no monsters, open the closet, everything's okay, show them it's safe. But th here we're talking about people in the dark, okay? People purposefully really in the dark, and they've really ignored the monster of sin in their life. Fornication, it'll blind people, it binds people, it's like a chain. You need to address it in the church. And people can't sit and live in willful fornication and be told that, or, or, or and be in the congregation. They need to be put out until such a time as they repent. Uh, the child in the dark, maybe if you have a kid that you turn the light on, they yell at you because, oh man, you know, their pupils are all open, dilated and stuff, and then they're mad because you're shining the light after they've slept through the night. Or miners who've been down in a coal mine, they have their pupils so large when they come up, you know, that the light is too bright for them. And really, that's one of the reasons people don't want those doctrines taught, because they're loving the darkness and they hate the light. You know, and we always have to think about them. Uh, so, what happens in this church in Thyatira, they ignore... The Jezebel spirit, and the Jezebel spirits teaches, you're okay. Grace covers all. Grace covers all. See? And they don't tell them about sin. So they suffer that woman Jezebel to teach, and they do nothing about it. And that's a bad teaching. So, <clears throat> it, it, this was a bit of commentary. It's not said that Jezebel receives sympathy or encouragement, but merely that she's let alone and her wickedness is, is left unchecked, and that's sinful too. Okay, I think that's an interesting point. Now, in 1 Kings it, uh, 21, 25, I'll read this one. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. 
whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. Okay? So Ahab wasn't ruling his house well. His, his wife did that. And see, it's written to the pastor. The pastor needs to put down that spirit and say, no, we cannot have that. So, of course, all of this, uh, there's a lot of people falling into idolatry and paganism. That's uh, the teachings of the Jezebel spirit. It's absolutely teaching about sexual immorality and things like that, which can be a form of idolatry. People can fall into idolatry and sexual immorality. And it's a really a growth, kind of, of what started in Pergamos, in a sense. Because the world's let in, well, it starts to even grow more. So when you look at that timeline standpoint. Um, verse 21, Revelation 2. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now remember, true repentance acknowledges sin, turns to Christ, and it will result in a change of action. There are many people who have prayed a prayer, but they're not following through. And people say, well, you're preaching work salvation. No, I'm not preaching work salvation. I just if you truly have come to Christ and come to a place where you've acknowledged your sin, you're going to want to change. Okay? And I'm not saying that we don't all struggle with sin at times in our life. You know, but then remember our first works, like the Church of Ephesus. Remember that first love and how you love to read the Bible, love to pray, and get back into that. Uh, Romans 2, verse 4. I'll let you turn to Romans 2, 4. You know, it, this is really kind of the attitude. Well, God doesn't judge right now, and it's really an attitude of Laodicea as well. Romans 2, 4 says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, you really despise salvation, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You know, because if you come to Christ, now you he gives you the power within to turn from sin. It's not turning from sin that's going to save you. It's turning to the Savior, but you will turn from sin as a result of that. Ecclesiastes 8. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 8. The teacher in Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> so, so many people say, well, you know, it's just long-suffering. Here's Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. Ecclesiastes 8, 11. It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Well, he didn't do anything about it right there. I just did it, you know. And it's not happening right now that God doesn't do that. They're, you know, ignoring that. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, Neither shall he prolong his days, which are a shadow, because he feareth not before God. Even if he lives to be a hundred and lives in sin, all of a sudden he'll realize what a mistake he's made. Okay? So because it isn't immediately sentenced by God, they take that for being fine or okay, or j just do it. Psalm 10, he hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, shall, for I shall never be in adversity. That's what uh, Psalm 10 verse 6 says. You know, I'm not going to move because God doesn't do anything about it. Now, idolatry to this church is spoken of both as whoredom and adultery. In one case, it's really a contrast to the marriage tie between God and his faithful worshipers. And in the other, it's a violation of it. Jezebel really anticipates the harlot that we're going to talk about in Revelation 17. Balaam anticipates the false prophet of Revelation 13. When we get there. Um, so, uh, be, uh, look back at verse 22. He says, behold. Now that behold, we really have to pay attention to that. Um, it demands attention. Behold, I will cast her into bed. Remember, Jezebel, back in Ahab's day, led them into idolatry. Okay, she led them away. So, um, again, I'm not... I'm not taken away. I believe there's sexual sin. I believe there's idolatrous sin. She taught the people to uh, worship idols. And really that doctrine of the Nicolaitans with the lamb, he also 
uh, he couldn't curse Israel. But what he could do is he could, uh, he, he told them what they could do. They could lead them into idolatry, get them to sleep with the women, and then the women would teach them about uh, idols and things like that. And that's this same spirit. Um, Jezebel, it's interesting, with, with that behold, she was suddenly thrown from the balcony and eaten by dogs. Literal dogs, yes. But dogs uh, can also represent those that follow other gods. So I believe this church will be thrown into the great tri tribulation and those that worship other gods will attack this false church one day. Um, those that haven't come to truly know the Savior. Uh, Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8 he tried, he believes, but then he tries to pay money so that he can lay hands on people and they receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter told him, repent therefore of thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be uh, forgiven thee. That, there's idolatry in that. You know, it's a spirit of a special power. Really, again, all these things kind of work together. Satan's kind of got them all intertwined. You know, the Gnosticism, the special knowledge along with this. Um... So she led him to a looseness of morals. Always that deeper knowledge as we study it. Uh, let's go to uh, verse 25. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my Father. Jesus is right, and he will one day have that might. He's all-powerful. There are those that grab things wrongly in the pretense of having power. He'll shatter that to pieces one day with the word of his mouth. Much right now, as Jezebel grabbed power to put it over the people, he'll come on them suddenly at the end of the tribulation and take, take it all away and shatter it to pieces. And he'll rule and reign for a thousand years. Verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now again, Thyatira was known for purple dye. So I want to end with this part. I really was excited about this part. Let's go to Acts 16. We're going to end in Acts 16 uh, today. So we don't want that Jezebel spirit, that spirit teaching, pulling people away to idols, to other things, to worshiping God. But let's look at a specific person. We're going to look at Lydia in Acts 16. Let's look at verse 12. And from thence to Philippi. So Acts 16, verse 12. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city in that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain dates. And on the Sabbath, we went out to the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. So... To women out there, here's, here's always the question. Will you follow a Jezebel or will you follow the Lord? It really ends up being almost that simple. Okay? You're going to follow Jezebel spirit or you're going to follow what the Lord says. And he's talking to the women here. And verse 14, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened and that she attended under the things which were spoken of Paul. She's from Thyatira. She's a selling, selling purple isn't wrong. Okay. She was opened. Her heart was open to the things of God. I believe this is the place where she got saved. She was religious before this. She was a seller of purple. But symbolically, if you're selling the things of God, you have that Jezebel spirit. I'm not saying she did. She had just heard it. She believed it. She trusted it. But if you're selling out, you're wrong. The gospel's a free gift. So here, you know, before this, she isn't saved. She gets saved. She trusts in Jesus Christ. She trusts that. Verse 15, and when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us. And which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, crying, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us unto the way of salvation. 
And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. And when her masters, and it's interesting, and he came out that same out of, hour of, out of that female, the male spirit came out of, out of her. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. Verse 19, and when her masters saw that the hope of the gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. And he brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither do they observe, being Romans. Now, it goes on. You can read that. I think you can read that. But I just think it's interesting how, okay, the purple. She, had, she was a seller of purple, but she had to come to a knowledge of Christ. If somebody is in that church, you can look... All great if you want. You can dress up for church. You can look good. You can be a leader of a church and go to hell. That's right. Okay? You have to trust Christ. Are you open to the things of God? Have you trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation? But in this, let's remember Roman prisoners. I got just one more little thing. Roman prisoners, Roman prisons were more secure than ours. <laughs> because if they escaped, then the, they killed the guards. Okay? I mean, it didn't matter. If, if somebody escaped, they killed the guards. <laughs> okay, the guards were guilty. So, you know, this guard, when uh, these doors are shaken, they're thrown in prison at this point. The doors are shaken, and Paul and Silas are in there, and they uh, he, he's about to fall on his sword. He's taking his sword. He's going to fall on it and kill himself. And they say, don't hurt yourself. We're all here. Nobody left. None of them. Not, I mean, not, I don't know if he witnessed to all the others in prison and they all got saved too. I don't know how many were in there. Maybe it was just them, but uh, nobody left. So then he took them to his house and he got saved in his household. Now some use this whole passage because Lydia's household got saved. They all had to individually trust Christ. Okay. And they all did. Okay. And so that's more of a prophecy that he said, die in thy household. So he went there and they preached it and they, he got saved. And then he took them back. They went to court. Uh, um, and Paul lawyers up Next, he says, well, we're Roman citizens and you beat us. He's, he uses this from time to time. You know, one time he, he ends up, well, I'm a Roman citizen. And he, he takes the court date. This one, he lets them release it, you know. And it scares him because he uses the law against them and they let him go. Well, then if you look at verse 40, it says, And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. It's interesting because they went to the house of Lydia then. I do believe she was pretty wealthy because she's the traitor in purple. But I, she opened her house to believers. She had the gift of hospitality already. And I believe she probably used all her money, you know, for the Lord's work from this point on. You know, but we can have the money. We can have all the idolatrous things. Isaiah 55 says, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money. Buy any, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you today that the gospel is a free gift. It's a free gift of salvation. People need to turn to you and just trust what you did on the cross. We pray if any out there haven't trusted just you and you alone and what you did on the cross, if they're trusting in anything else, it's idolatry. If they're praying to Mary, they're trusting that. They're, they're trusting an idol. Uh, they're bowing down to an altar. They're trusting an idol. Uh, they're living in sexual immorality thinking that's okay. They're trusting an idol and thinking that God just overlooks that. I'm not talking about a legalistic view. It's just we have to have a view that sin is sin, Lord, and that we turn to you for forgiveness of sin, and then we ask you to help sanctify our lives, to live lives that are worthy of your calling from that point on, and that should be our hope. Uh, so we pray for any out there as they continue to just trust you what you did on the cross and look to live a life sanctified before you in jesus name we pray amen, amen.